Danielle Conway is uh, the Michael Marks Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Hawaii. She is a wonderful colleague and mentor of mine. She is a star in intellectual property and government contracts law. And it, it was a particular honor for me that she contributed to this book because this was her first piece about implicit bias. She will be on this afternoon's Breath of Implicit Bias panel talking about her chapter. But for now, she's serving as chair and moderator of this outstanding panel. So Danielle. I have the distinct pleasure of being here at Justin's invitation. Thank you to the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute and Professor Ogletree. We have a fabulous second panel for you. Rob Smith is the co-editor of this book and he is a fabulous editor and so thoughtful. So he took a look at all of our pieces and actually made them work really well. So thank you, Rob. He'll be first. And then Michelle Goodwin will be next. She is professor of law extraordinaire. She is a phenomenal woman, and many of you know the reference I'm making. So we are so pleased that she's going to be on this panel. She is many of our mentor here. So thank you, Michelle, for always being there for us. Chuck Lawrence, he is the father of the thing that we are talking about today, and we have a privilege of calling him a colleague at the University of Hawaii. He is our centennial professor of law there, but he has obviously been many places, one of which is Georgetown Law, so he's gonna give us the depth that we need. We have Rachel Goodsill. She is not only a professor, but a litigator, former litigator. So she's going to be bringing theory and practice of implicit bias to us. We're very happy to have you from Seton Hall. And ultimately, we have Jerry Kong, who is himself fabulous in his own right. He's going to be talking to us about some very complicated yet provocative topics in implicit bias. And we are very pleased to have him here. So that way, I don't have to introduce them. They can just get up and speak. I'm honored and thrilled to be here with you today. And I'd like to talk to you for a while about our criminal justice system in America. It's no longer front page news that our system of incarceration is the largest in the world. We incarcerate roughly one out of every 100 of our citizens. And if we talk about the number of people who are on probation or parole, that number balloons to about 7 million people. And our system of mass incarceration isn't just the number of people who are behind bars or on probation or parole under legal supervision. It's also the roughly 2.2 million people that that system employs, meaning that it employs more people than our systems of higher education and public welfare combined. And when we talk about the criminal justice system and just how large it is, it's important to talk about that it's our racial and ethnic minorities in this country that carry the largest burden under that system. The racial disparities are stark. Roughly one in every eight black American males are incarcerated under legal supervision. Um, at the turn of the century, if you're an African American male, your chances are about one out of three um, that you'll be under legal supervision at the state or federal level at some point uh, during your lifetime. And so the question is, what explains these disparities? Why is it that our racial and ethnic minorities carry this large burden? And there are a lot of explanations, most of them interrelated, poverty, histories of um, joblessness and unemployment, differences in, in offense rates for some types of crimes, uh, overt race bias. I want to talk to you today about the role that I believe implicit racial bias plays in, in this stark disparities that we have in our system of mass incarceration. I want to be clear at the outset that I'm not saying that race bias, implicit racial bias, explains completely or even a majority of the disparities in our system, but I hope to convince you that it's worth our serious and careful attention. So the first panel did an unbelievable job of giving an overview of implicit bias. And since I'm probably going to run too long anyway, I'm just going to skip that part altogether. But we're talking about what type of associations matter, what type of automatic associations for the criminal justice system. Well, a plethora of research shows us first that Americans associate white, black, Americans of all stripes and colors and shapes associate black Americans with violence, 
as being prone to criminality, with hostility, and with dangerousness. Right? And when we think about these associations, there's also pretty clear evidence that the emotion of fear mediates this response. Right? So um, studies have, have put images of black faces and white faces and measured the brain activity in the area of the brain that controls um, things such as perceived threats. And when shown a black face, um, that level of the activity in the brain is increased, showing that it seems like these responses, once they're triggered, um, also trigger the emotion of fear. And so, so what does this mean? Well, think about it as a legislator. You're trying to decide what to do with cocaine policy, and specifically, how do you treat crack cocaine versus powdered cocaine? Well, if you think about crime in America, and you think about crack specifically, and we associate it with black Americans, right? And so you think about, well, if, if we have this act, we think of the black American, you think of the activation of, of fear and, and, and dangerousness and, and prone to criminality, you might think that the crack problem is a problem that, that is indeed, it is dangerous, right? But something that's, that's more dangerous than actually is, we might perceive it differently than if the face of, uh, of the crack problem were white. And we see that, right, with crystal meth. And so um, I'll tell you a quick story of the difference between these two. Len Bias, who was an all-star basketball standout, right? He's drafted to the NBA, and then he dies from a cocaine overdose. And most people still assume that it was a crack cocaine overdose. It turns out it was powdered cocaine. But shortly after his death, Congress took up this issue of how do you deal with crack cocaine? And 11 times during the congressional testimonies, this reference to Len Bias and his death from crack cocaine. There's a researcher at Seattle University Law School now who's looking, well, how do we treat meth, right? Meth is a big problem. It's the new most dangerous drug there is. But the face of meth are white people. And so when, you, when she went and looked at the uh, state legislatures and how are they dealing with meth, you saw a lot more examples of, you know, that can happen to my brother, to, to my cousin, right? This is a serious addiction. We need to figure out not only how to punish, but how to rehabilitate these people. And so the, the activations of these stereotypes, is, it a black, is the face of crime black, is it hostile and, and violent, um, make a difference in our, in our drug policy, at least can make a difference in our drug policy. But it's not just at the legislative level. If you think about the Department of Justice just recently released a report of the New Orleans Police Department. And one of the findings they found was that uh, officer-involved shootings, there's a stark disparity that's unexplained um, by any other of the, the factors they try to run, um, where, where officer-involved shootings disproportionately involve a black male. And so if you're walking in an area that you perceive to be a high-crime area, right, and, and, and you're a police officer and you come across two young teenagers, and one of them's African-American, one's white, and automatically we have these activations of beliefs of is this person dangerous or are they violent, right? Then it has, to, it has to enter into your calculation of how far will my moral authority as a police officer take me or will I need to use my, my gun or my uh, nightstick to, to help make sure that I'm safe uh, in, in this area. But these implicit biases aren't just reactions to hostility and violence and, and the idea that um, black Americans are prone to criminality. It also works in a slightly uh, different way. So uh, there's also associations between black Americans and the idea that black Americans are more or static, somehow less fully human um, and capable of evolution than white Americans. So there's a great study by Jeff, uh, Phil uh, Goff and his colleagues at Stanford, when he was at Stanford, and he, what they do is they prime, right, we talked about, um, Professor Devine talked about the priming studies, what they do is they show a picture of either a consciously undetectable picture of either a, a black person, a white person, or, or nobody at all for a fraction of a second. And then they bring a degraded image of an ape uh, into focus over about 40 frames. And when primed with a black face, people were able to recognize the image as an ape in far fewer frames than when primed with either a white face or with uh, no face at all. And equally important, when, when primed with a white face versus no face at all, people actually took longer periods of time to recognize the image as an ape, which lead the authors to believe that there's this link between um, black Americans and, and this less than fully human 
um, ate by cannibal. And you're so, that study in itself, you're like, oh, it's kind of interesting, but how does it really translate into the criminal justice process, right? And so what these researchers then did is they took an image of either an ape or a cat-like object, or a cat-like object, a big cat, uh, or, no, uh, or no image at all, and they, they use that as the prime, right? So they flash it a consciously undetectable period of time, and then they show people an image of a, a car chase that ends in a police beating. And when primed with a black face, people felt that that beating was more justified, more deserved than when primed with a, no, a white face or no face at all, right? And so when we think about, well, what is it about um, these stereotypes, less static, less capable of change, and how could it impact the broad array of the criminal justice system? Well, imagine a judge trying to decide whether or not uh, you should send a, an offender to drug court, right, to kick a habit, uh, or, or to prison. Well, like, is this person likely to change, right? Are they likely to get the treatment they need and come out, in the, better, uh, come out the better for it, or is this person uh, beyond hope? Or how carefully we track down leads when the crime victims are of one race uh, versus another. And the final way that I think implicit bias can impact the criminal justice system is through Dr. Banaji talked about this idea of in-group favoritism, implicit in-group favoritism. Um, so there's a study, I know uh, Jerry's talked about it uh, in some of his work, where they randomly assign people to groups that are just made up. I think one's called the Zans and one are called the Canties, Quanties or something. And so what happens is people randomly assign these groups that don't exist and shortly thereafter, right, People think all sorts of great things about the group that they're assigned to that has no real independent meaning and really bad things about this other group that five minutes ago they didn't know existed. Right? And so if you translate that into the criminal justice system, that type of, in the same way I think fear mediates these associations of dangerousness and, and, uh, and violence and hostility, you know, empathy mediates these ideas of in-group favoritism. And so think of the capital sentencing context. You have a death penalty case, and in the death penalty cases, they usually put on victim impact statements. And oftentimes these are videos, right? And so you have a video, and maybe you have a montage of all these pictures, and you have a, a, a mostly white jury. Most juries in capital cases are mostly white. You have a mostly white jury. You're, you see these videos on the screen. It's one picture after another of this uh, white girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. You know, maybe you have Celine Dion in the background, right? These people sort of dress like you. It kind of looks like your neighborhood. This can be your, your daughter, your niece, your neighbor. Um, and compare that to when you have a, a black American victim and uh, the, 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 the physical looks are different, um, the neighborhoods can be far different, the, the, it's probably, it might, it might be Celine Dion, it, you know, it might not. Uh, and so, but these differences, these implicit differences that lead towards um, the disparate activations of, of, um, of these associations and of empathy can lead to believing that a crime against somebody who is a black American is less serious, less heinous, less cruel than a crime against somebody um, who is like you, a, a, a white American. And so let me wrap up by talking about what do we do with this information, right? And so in one way, in some circumstances, the answer might be that we try to figure out how do we reduce implicit bias or institutional design if we're going directly at the implicit bias. Um, how do we reduce implicit bias itself? And so, for example, in the school context, um, we know this about the school to prison pipeline, disproportionate number of African Americans are excluded from school. When they're excluded from school, they're more likely to be, end up in, the, in the, our system of incarceration. And so it turns out when researchers look at offense rates, most of the people are expelled for things like boisterous conduct, disorderly conduct. What does that mean? It's subjective, it's discretionary, right? And it turns out that offense rates between um, white students and black students, no different, right? And so in that context, being able to reduce implicit bias directly might help solve our problem. But in other contexts, reducing implicit bias won't necessarily help. Um, and so, a really cool woman. <laughs> and so, um, for example, we represented a client, Corey Miller. Corey was sentenced um, to uh, life imprisonment for murder on a 10 to 2 verdict. The two people in the minority were African Americans. Lucky they made it on the jury. Despite being in Jefferson Parish, 25% African American, the prosecution struck most of the jurors by asking one simple question How do you feel on a scale of 1 to 10 about the Jefferson Parish 
Police Department. Jefferson Parish elected David Duke as their, uh, their leader. Uh, Jefferson Parish, notoriously known for Brady violations, for police brutality, um, for wrongful convictions, for high death sentencing rates. How would you feel if you were black in Jefferson Parish about the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Department? Not very good, right? And so reducing implicit bias won't necessarily take us there. We need to solve the underlying policing and cultural problems in that area. So it's like putting on our glasses and the problem just comes more into focus. And so in that situation, substantive things, ending felon disenfranchisement so more people can uh, participate in the system of justice, uh, reducing mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenses that mostly impact African American individuals, ending non-unanimous jury verdicts are the solution. So I hope that the message that um, you've come across today is that we have all these points of discretion from forming the criminal law to how we investigate and prosecute crimes to how we sentence people to how we release people back out into the community and at all these discretion points that little pieces of implicit bias can add up throughout a case and when we move from the case level to a county to the state to our criminal justice system at whole I, the criminal the implicit bias really is something that becomes worthy of our our careful attention and concern thank you I want to thank uh, Justin and Rob. Um, our publisher, John Berger, is here uh, from Cambridge uh, as well today. And thank you, Danielle, for that wonderful introduction. So the stakes are high uh, when we're talking about implicit uh, bias, and they certainly are uh, high and transparent when it comes to medicine. So. My chapter uh, with my co-author, Dr. Naomi Duke, takes up this issue of cognitive bias in medicine, focusing specifically on the role of racial bias in maintaining inequities in health and health care. Practicing medicine requires physicians to diagnose conditions on the basis of ambiguous symptoms, sometimes under severe time pressure and often with the patient's well-being in jeopardy. Such uncertainty requires physicians to make decisions based on probability assessments, which in turn require physicians to make uh, decisions um, that involve assigning meanings to a host of variables that pertain to a patient. Too often, racial background uh, is one such variable. Our claim is that the interaction between a physician and a black patient can trigger a cascade of stereotypes about black people. For example, that black people eat diets richer in food, richer in fats and grease, uh, fried foods, or that black women uh, will refuse to exercise, uh, which in turn become part of the context in which a diagnosis is made. Similarly, a stereotype that black patients do not adhere to their medical regimen as faithfully as white patients do could influence how a physician opts to treat a diagnosed condition, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in regard to organ transplantation. But in both scenarios, one where stereotypic knowledge about black citizens could alter the diagnosis, and the other where the same could alter treatment the point is the same, and that point is that physicians apply group stereotypes to individual patients without conscious regard for whether those stereotypes are accurate or not, and even if they are, whether the particular patient at issue is a counter-typical example. Now, in the medical context, the answer to those questions, which physicians are not usually privy to because of implicit uh, bias, frequently operates uh, without conscious awareness, this literally could mean the difference between life and death. Not only can implicit racial bias influence individual decisions about a particular patient, but those individual decisions can aggregate over the course of the client-patient relationship and risk resulting in substantively different treatment for similarly situated patients of different ethnicities. And what we have seen and what the literature certainly bears out is that there are biases that cannot be explained by education, by insurance, by income, or a host of other variables. So something else is in operation uh, 
in the medical suite. And I want to now turn away from that little bit that I read from our chapter to discussing with you a few anchoring moments in history and then go through a, a, a brief um, category of uh, descriptive areas where these disparities exist. So most of us have heard of what's referred to as the Tuskegee experiment. And it's one where experiment took place over the course of 40 years involving uh, poor African-American men many of whom were farmers, uh, most of whom uh, were illiterate. This study, which was a syphilis study, uh, these men were not given syphilis, as some people believe, but the point is that while they had syphilis, uh, for over 40 years, a study that involved Johns Hopkins, involved the, the government and whatnot, these men were not given the treatment for their condition. In fact, the purpose of the study was actually to see them die and then to, uh, to do autopsies and see how uh, syphilis affected their dead bodies. Now, this occurred even after Nuremberg, uh, which introduced research protocols. Uh, this was after we knew that penicillin treats syphilis. These men infected their wives. Their children were born maimed. Um, their children were born with syphilitic conditions. Uh, and then we can also think about other anchoring moments in history that take us back to slavery, right? So Dr. Marion Sims, who's considered the father of gynecology, a person who uh, kept his own sort of little clinic in a slave shack at the back of his home. Uh, in his autobiography, he talks about the epiphanies he'd have in the middle of the night. And after an epiphany, he'd have to rush to his clinic at the back of his home and begin cutting into African slave women while he was trying to perfect treatments that would be used on white women. Now this was without any kind of anesthesia because even back then we believed that black women were impermeable to pain. We just don't feel pain. And in his autobiography as he talks about the cutting and the stitching and whatnot, what's so fascinating is that for decades now, for more than a century, this autobiography is used as a sort of anchoring moment in medicine, right? How wonderful what this father of gynecology has done. There are three statues in the United States that are devoted to Marion Sims. One of them is in uh, Central Park. And then, of course, there's the other anchoring moment, and there are many of these that I could talk about, but time keeps me at a limit here, and that is the pillaging of black bodies uh, from cemeteries, right? So black bodies were frequently used uh, in founding American medicine. Uh, young doctors at the University of Michigan, uh, at Harvard, at Johns Hopkins, uh, were motivated to, sometimes they did it themselves, sometimes they paid for, their institutions paid for these, for people to go and just pillage black graves, just dig up the bodies so that we could build our medical schools. Now these are all parts of history that many people don't know about, but certainly what was happening there, many could say that was just absolutely conscious, uh, kind of bias that was happening, conscious, unconscious, these things uh, were occurring. And now as we sort of look forward, we see that it, this human research um, continues to occur in ways that are very problematic, and I'll talk some about that. But let's just think about these disparities that continue to occur, disparities across pain treatment, diagnostic screening, uh, general medical care, mental health diagnoses, HIV-related care, treatment for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease. Earlier, uh, there was uh, the issue of organ transplantation uh, that came up. And I think it serves as a very interesting example as to bias in the medical sphere, uh, and implicit bias, in fact, because within the context of organ transplantation, there is no standard as to how we put a person on an organ transplant wait list. It's all subjective. And so although African Americans are in the greatest need amongst any US population for kidneys, let's say, and it's true, they have the greatest demand, and yet they wait the longest on our kidney transplant wait list, they have the highest death rate uh, while on that list, and they're the least likely of any ethnic group to receive their kidneys in any timely way. In fact, they're kicked off the list more frequently uh, than other groups are. There's more that could be said about this, but I think the, the point um, to be made here is about how these heuristic shortcuts 
not only intervene across the criminal law sphere, but they also intervene in the medical sphere. Now, I want to turn quickly to two categories that help us to, to think about this in even more nuanced ways. For example, the intersection between gender, race, and class. There is a very pernicious form of policing that is taking place now in the reproductive suite across the United States. And here what I'm referring to are the arrests of pregnant women. And these are poor women and they're being arrested for not reproducing or not being pregnant in the right way. So for example, being arrested for falling down steps or being arrested for refusing to, uh, un for refusing to go to bed rest. Uh, for example, which some might argue is not real kind of um, incarceration, it's just being held at a hospital, but still being held against one's will, or who we decide to shackle when women are giving birth in the most inhumane kinds of condition, or women being uh, led away from the birthing suite while bleeding uh, profusely uh, in the police cars or, or otherwise, and who's making these decisions and who's being instantiated as the gatekeepers in these domains but doctors and nurses. And there's so much more that could be said about this, even about how doctors and nurses are being trained by law enforcement individuals as to who they should police and who they should profile, which is also a very dangerous intersection between both law and also medicine. But then I would turn um, your attention from there to the issue involving children as research subjects. And just before I do, one point that I would like to make about this policing that, that intersects on reproduction and also the criminal law sphere. Although we know that African American women are less likely to abuse alcohol during their pregnancy, they're less likely to smoke marijuana during their pregnancy, they're 10 times more likely when it is discovered that they did take out, drink alcohol during their pregnancy, they're 10 times more likely to be turned over to child wel welfare services across the country. And I think that's a very important point to make that intersects with Rob's talk there. There's a, a class action lawsuit that is currently um, in the works, if you will, that uh, is the result of a lead uh, based study. And this is a very interesting point about who it is that we choose to subject to certain kinds of conditions and whose bodies do not get subjected to those conditions. And this lead based study that was uh, designed and implemented by the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is an institute at Johns Hopkins, they enrolled more than a hundred African American kids, 12 months old to five years old. And they were lured into the study, or their parents were, uh, under the pretense, and they did receive uh, significantly reduced or free housing. But what their parents did not know is that these children would be exposed to dramatically elevated uh, rates of lead in that environment. So they, the kids were sort of put into an environment where there was lead-based paint and lead-based dust all throughout the apartments. Parents had no idea. And after parents began to find out that their children had two or three or four or five or six times the amount of lead exposure than they were supposed to have, the parents were not offered treatment for their children. In fact, one of the key researchers in that study, Dr. Uh, Gary Goldstein, and this is not 100 years ago, this just last year was announced this, this class action suit was going forward, but uh, researcher Dr. Gary Goldstein said that this research con was conducted in the best interest of all of those children involved. And so then we see this other really pernicious form of this implicit bias that not only is it there in terms of how the study is designed, but after being confronted with it, the response is that this was good for those kids and how so. Now, let me just close up um, my talk by saying that I think that one of the most important things that we can do is to, in fact, spend some time thinking about these anchoring moments. And sometimes it takes us a while to get back to the anchoring moment. And I'll close with an anchoring moment that I think is still uh, incredibly important as we think forward about how we conduct medicine and how we conduct medical research and how we treat bodies. And that is eugenics in the United States. And many people think about eugenics in Germany and eugenics in Germany as being the anchoring moment that ultimately leads to 
the death of millions of people. But what people do not connect to this horrible German experiment is that it begins in the United States. And that in 1927, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, in deciding whether or not a young girl who was poor and who was white, and implicit bias goes in that way too, that this young girl, Carrie Buck, was deserving of being sterilized against her will. And what Justice Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes said was that three generations of imbeciles are enough. It's better that we not wait to, uh, to prosecute these people or incarcerate the offspring of these degenerate types or to execute these degenerate people for their tendencies we are all better off if, in fact, these individuals, such as Carrie Buck, are not permitted to reproduce. And it is on the basis of that decision and the law, the model law that was under that, that Germany adopts it, and then we see Germany's final solution. I think we're all better off by remembering these moments and thinking um, with more depth, more nuance, and with a bit more honesty about how we, too, can be prone to the same kinds of conditions and can become animated by the same kinds of biases as we see elsewhere. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I want to thank Michelle for taking us uh, back to these uh, foundational historical moments that our implicit biases arise out of, and you will see that my talk uh, follows this. So I want to start out with a, um, asking you to look at a 90 seconds of a wonderful video that was made by a young black high school girl in New York. Okay. Uh, I want you to remember the expression on that little girl's face who was last up on the screen in response to the question, which doll looks like you? the way she starts to push the white doll forward and then pulls it back and pushes the black doll forward. Dr. Kenneth Clark's doll test, um, which this young woman was replicating and remembering, cited in Brown, is of course the original piece of implicit bias research on education and one of the original pieces of implicit bias work. Social scientists criticized Dr. Clark's methodology and legal scholars called the court unprincipled for basing constitutional interpretation on psychological speculation. But the Dahl test revealed the central truth about the injury of segregation. Segregated schools achieved their purpose by telling a story about black children that is part of the larger narrative that rationalizes and justifies treating them as inferior human beings. I believe that this truth, that this truth-revealing task should also be the primary mission of today's implicit bias research. I want to think about how the research on implicit bias might help us to understand two related aspects of the continuing injury of ra racism and segregation in education. The first is the injury of how black and brown children are seen, imagined, treated. When I teach my students about unconscious racism, I ask them to think about the meaning that's given the current words that are used in the educational policy debate, standards, assessment, accountability, achievement gap, classroom management, no tolerance discipline. How do we picture the people who are talked about with these words? Who is not up to standard? Who needs to be tested? Who are the students and teachers in the failing school? Who needs to be held accountable? Who sits at the bottom of the achievement gap? Who needs not to be tolerated in terms of discipline? In a fourth grade class at Terrell Elementary School in Fort Worth, Texas, students sit in a semicircle around their teacher and chant out letter sounds. Words and answers come in unison. 
Read, spell, read, the teacher says, snapping her fingers as she says each word. And the students read the chanting, read the word chanting in unison. Carpet, they spell it, C-A-R-P-E-T. Then they chant it again, louder than the first time. Carpet. In a fifth grade classroom across the hall, a young second year teacher leads the class in reading comprehension ex exercise. It is nearly as fast paced as the phonics lessons. Students read short passages and are repeatedly prompted to mine the facts and define the vocabulary words. The teacher comes to a passage where the word drain appears. This is the part of the sink the water goes down is called the drain, she says, reading the prescribed words for the teacher printed in her blue instruction book and prompting her students by pounding her marker against the book. They repeat, the part of the sink that the water goes down is called the drain. Then she asks, what is the part of the sink that the water goes down? A drain, they chant in unison. Across the nation, under the No Child Left Behind Act, in school districts serving poor and minority children, there are classrooms that look and sound like these. What do we believe about the intellectual gifts of these children that moves us to think that this pedagogy is suited to them, but not to the children of the privileged? A second related injury that derives from the story that the story of segregation is one that rationalizes our tolerance of the savage inequalities of race and class in American education. Just as segregation injures the black child by telling her she cannot be smart and beautiful, it also injures her again by telling us we need not care that she is injured by making us tolerate the continued inequalities of access and material that she suffers. Segregated schools build a wall between poor black and brown children and those with privilege, influence, and power. The wall denies them access to the resources we command, social, political, and economic. Although the wall is not a physical structure or a prohibition mandated by law, it nonetheless permits and encourages us to hoard our wealth on one side while the children on the other side are left with little. The genius of segregation as a tool of oppression is in its single, it sends, to the oppressors, that their monopoly on resources is legitimate that there is no need for sharing, no moral requirement of empathy and care. The children on the other side of the wall are not our own. They are not kin to us. They may not even belong to the same species. They are different from us in essential, unchangeable ways. They do not belong to our community. This is the meaning of Brown's observation that segregation is un inherently unequal. Of course, today's segregation is not the product of intentional government decisions. Rather, it is what is the courts have come to call de facto segregation. De facto segregation does not constitute cognizable constitutional injury because it is caused by the actions, not caused by actions traceable to the state, but by the private acts of individuals who choose to live in segregated neighborhoods or choose to send their children to a segregated schools. In the years immediately following Brown versus Board of Education, and I was around in those years, we spoke of de facto segregation with the understanding that despite the absence of legal injury, there was still an injury. In fact, an injury we could see and measure, an injury caused by our private acts a moral injury for which we were personally responsible and collectively responsible. However, we have come to think of de facto segregation not simply as the absence of a judicially cognizable constitutional injury, but as the absence of any injury at all. If poor black children are injured, it is not by their racial and economic isolation, but by dysfunctional schools 
and perhaps by their own ineptitude or culture. The word segregation is rarely spoken in public policy discussions or private conversations. Almost no one talks about racism, stigma, or white flight, or about what whites are running from and what they are taking with them. There's a great deal of conversation about bloated bureaucracy, a corrupt teachers union, incompetent school administrators, but there's silence on the subject of race and racism, silence about segregation and their relationship to increasingly privatized view of education. This is the more complicated story that must be understood. It is a story of people of goodwill who are nonetheless responsible for the segregation of public schools, white parents with black friends, colleagues, and neighbors who are afraid to send their children to public schools where most of the children are black, brown, and poor, black and middle-class parents who are also afraid. These fears are related to race and racism, and they divert us from thinking about injury to the moral obligation of inclusion in community. These fears, this rationalization of unmet moral obligation is the work of implicit bias. My chapter in this book examines the conversation about the achievement gap, a conversation that is central to today's educational policy debate. I'm interested in the text or content of that conversation. I want to listen to and understand the stories we tell and hear about race, or more accurately, the stories we tell and hear about white supremacy. For I think it is very important that in understanding bias, conscious or unconscious, we speak accurately and honestly about the bias with which we are concerned, that we are clear about why it concerns us. The problem, the normative wrong of raci racial bias resides within the ideology of white supremacy. I want to understand the process of implicit bias, what parts of the brain it works in, but I do not want to lose sight of the primary goal, reconstructing white supremacy's structural and ideological edifice. When that baby girl in that film says the white doll is beautiful and the doll that looks most like her ugly, she is telling us a story that we have told her. She believes that story because we believe it. She doesn't need an ITA to reveal her belief in the story because she has not yet learned the lesson that we no longer tell this story out loud. The most important part of making our implicit biases visible, of proving to us that we are still racist, is not to nail another criminal, to say, I got you, you're a racist, or even to meet the legal requirement of proving racial motive or, or, or intent, although that is important. Rather, we must uncover the racism we hide from ourselves so that we know that rights, white supremacy remains alive and well, and we must continue to fight it in its structures, its institutions, and its more explicit versions. We cannot understand the meaning of the stories we tell today, the stories our children continue to hear, the stories that automatically influence our behavior and policy decisions without hearing and understanding the old stories that have shaped the new ones. And so in this chapter, my thesis is that our conversations about the achievement gap, the way we talk about the causes of underachievement of black children and the policies and practices we offer and adopt to cure that underachievement provide evidence of our continued implicit and explicit belief that these children are different, that they are intrinsically incapable of superior academic performance. Moreover, I argue that this conversation and the policies and practices that follow from them reinscribe segregation's injury, that as we talk about the achievement gap, we rebroadcast the defamatory message to the world and to the children themselves that we and they internalize the defamatory nature of their differentness, of their inferiority. 
And so um, my time is running out, so I just want to close with, with the, the rest of the shape of this chapter, which is that I, tell, I, I talk about three stories that you hear in this conversation. The first I call the story from nature. And this is the explicit story of inferiority that we used to have when those signs were up there. Um, the second is the story from structure. And this is the position uh, that I take, that these deficiencies in education come from uh, the structures of racism that continue to exist. And the third is the story that is most often told now, the story from culture. Uh, but in this chapter, I want to put those stories together to talk about how even we structuralists are infected by the story from nature, and how particularly the story from culture, the story that says that black children do not learn because of the culture they come from, is infected by the story from nature. Um, so I won't go through those st stories, but I want, to, want you to, to, to think about uh, that the, the fact that these ways that we talk now, we have to understand how they come from these explicit bias stories. Uh, and finally, uh, I just want to ask in closing, um, what I believe students of implicit bias should do in the face of these uh, interconnected stories and injuries of race. Um, the first thing I think is to make explicit and provide, make explicit the bias and provide children with the counter narrative of resistance. Claude Steele's work on stereotype threat is directly related to this task. Stereotype threat is what you see in the eyes of the little girl in the doll test. She doesn't know why she thinks she is ugly or why the doll is ugly. She doesn't understand that this is a story that comes from someone else that is told about her, that it isn't her story, that it isn't true. So we have to say the story's out there. You see the story. You're not the one that's crazy, but it's someone else's story, and we have to tell our children a story that resists that story, a counter-narrative. The second thing we have to do, and I'll close with this, is use our study of implicit bias to reveal the big lie of the legal doctrine and political rhetoric that denies our racism, the rationalizations are of our failure to meet the moral obligation to make all of our children our own. That implicit bias becomes implicit because of our need to deny. We don't have the motivation to tame bias because we're privileged by racial bias. White supremacy privileges white people. Class supremacy privileges people of a higher class, and male supremacy and misogyny privileges males. And this is why this first step that our psychologist told us, that we have to have the motivation to change our bias, is so difficult, that we have to face up to the fact um, that the counter-narrative has to come and it has to be explicit about the reasons for the existence of the bias, and it has to name the content of that implicit bias. Thank you. I'm actually going to continue where Professor Lawrence left off um, with a story of two neighborhoods and two communities. One, uh, Southampton, New York, and the other, East New York. And what brings these two uh, neighborhoods together, and they might not be neighborhoods often seen in the same frame, is that a developer named Thomas Polsonelli owned a piece of property in each. The property in Southampton was near a train trestle, and it was a fairly large property. The property in East New York was much smaller, and it was near several homes, uh, single-family homes and some larger homes for elderly uh, and several daycare centers. Mr. Polsonelli had a contract to build a Wastewood incinerator, where he would make approximately $6 million. He initially chose to site his wastewood incinerator in the train trestle area, which makes logical sense. It was further away from any people, and it was near a transportation mechanism. But perhaps not surprisingly, when that little notice was posted in the Southampton Village Press, um, 200 residents came to the meeting 
and expressed their disapproval, I'm sure, in very polite ways. Uh, Mr. Polsonelli, without any concern, immediately pulled back his proposal and concluding that perhaps communicating with communities was dangerous to his $6 million, went ahead and tried to build his wastewood incinerator in East New York without any public notice at all. So his was, here was his dilemma, his alternative energy money versus the potential for community opposition. Now, this is our question. Did P Mr. Polsonelli's actions constitute racism or something else? And I think the answer is somewhat complex. And I have two quotes up here that I won't read. Uh, one by Charles Barron, with whom I worked, and this is a case I litigated. This is my first environmental justice case with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And I say hello to my colleagues from LDF here today. So Charles Barron was a community letter leader from East New York who went on, after the end of the story, which you'll hear, uh, to become the city councilman for that area. And he was firmly convinced that this was racism, pure and simple. And he used that language when describing the case and continues to use it today in actually his uh, run for Congress, which is happening as we speak. Um, John Sampson, another legislator from New York, also thought race was a factor, but his question was sort of an in-group preference question, I think, as opposed to an out-group animus question. And so one of the questions, I guess, is, does it matter? Does it matter if we have racism in the classic sense of animus or contempt or lack of concern or a, um, a kind of lack of empathy for one group or whether there is a structural account or an implicit bias account or perhaps some version of all three. So what my chapter addresses and what I'll run through very quickly I know is whether there is bias in environmental protection, what kind of bias do we see and how might we as a legal community, a community of activists, social psychologists, um, uh, citizens of various sorts address this bias if it is present. So the first question is whose actions matter? What counts? And so what we'll see is in the environmental context, it's a range of actors. And what's also interesting about the environmental or land use context that's somewhat different from employment or education or even the criminal justice system is in some sense, it affects racialized areas as opposed to individuals. Because if you are a person of color living in Southampton, arguably you benefit from the white privilege and certainly the class privilege of the Southamptonites regardless of your own a particular class situation. Similarly, if you are white living in East New York, you arguably are harmed by the outgroup um, or the, the sort of lack of, of privilege or preference that the East New Yorkers experienced. And in fact, in the coalition that developed around that case, we had a multiracial group led by African Americans and Latinos, but that had white members as well. So you have private decision makers, companies that decide where initially to locate their facility, landlords, getting back to Professor Goodwin's story about lead paint, who decide how, much, how many resources to put to abating lead paint. Uh, individuals' decisions about whether to drive SUVs or to take the subway. Secondly, you have legislatures who enact laws. You have, uh, and we'll talk a, a little bit about some of the laws at the federal level, state level, and local level, but you have the actions of legislative bodies. Then, of course, there are the federal enforcement agencies, the state enforcement agencies, and the local enforcement agencies. And it is the confluence of all of those along with who the media cares about when it presents this information. Whose pollution, um, who, 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 whose harm from the effects of pollution do we hear about? Um, who do the courts protect when these issues come before them? So we have a wide range of actors, all of whose motivations, perceptions, distortions, heuristic, um, heuristic biases, and ultimately kind of institutional structures matter. So let's talk for a minute and come back to the story, just to ground ourselves a little bit. So what is the evidence for the role of race in Mr. Polsonelli's actions? Well, we have some evidence that race certainly played a role. When the um, Southampton community expressed its opposition in a single meeting, he backed off. When the East New York community learned about the potential for this wastewood incinerator, immediately group action uh, resulted. And there were hundreds of people at multiple protests, and Polsonelli dug in his heels, and he would not budge. So we have a clear instance of differential treatment. Um, 
Now, one could argue that there's a business reason for his actions in the second, uh, in the second context. He'd already lost once. He was going to lose his $6 million contract, so perhaps this wasn't race. This was a businessman trying to make uh, some money. Uh, perhaps there's a structural account that he was more confident that the Southamptonites could sustain opposition than he was of the East New Yorkers, regardless of his personal feelings. Again, that's a racialized account, but it's different from evidence about his personal state of mind. Um, then my second uh, comment, though, is, you know, I interacted with this man. I sat down at the table with him and negotiated, and contempt dripped from his every word. Just being honest. Now, this contempt and his, you know, desire to sit very far away from the community leaders, both of whom are African American, certainly is resonant with every uh, work I've read on implicit bias and racial anxiety. Um, there was, of course, a gender element as well. The, the, the community leaders chose me. I was 26, a young white woman, as opposed to an older white male lawyer who they could have chosen. So there was probably gender politics involved as well. So I, I, my sense is, from my personal experience, that race and gender, in an interpersonal relational uh, point of view, was at play. Now, again, arguably, it could have been if the Southamptonites were represented by people wearing you know, long beads with long hair who were white men and Birkenstocks, he might have had the same contempt. So there are other accounts. Um, my sense still is that race is involved, but ultimately, it probably doesn't matter whether it is an individualized racial account or a structural racial account. There is no question but that Southampton by Mr. Polsonelli was treated differently. So now we have the environmental laws. One's first question might be, how is it possible that the Clean Air Act, which is the federal statute that's in, supposed to protect us from pollutants in the air, didn't prohibit a wastewood incinerator from being located literally within two blocks of a daycare center. How is that possible? Well, again, I could spend a long time talking about the Clean Air Act's failure to account for cumulative and synergistic effects of pollution, failure to measure certain kinds of particulates that it turns out are put us most at risk, those that are very small. Um, and we have similar criticism from the environmental justice community about virtually every federal environmental statute. So again, the question arises, is there a racialized tale to tell? I think perhaps, because I think if you look at the crises in asthma rates, for example, that is a crisis particularly acute among African American and Latino children. If you look at the, the rates of respiratory ailments, and this is probably where we segue, the rates are particularly acute among African Americans and Latinos. So again, is this implicit racism that the people who enacted the Clean Air Act you know, had active animus? Probably not. Does this have something to do with perhaps the lesser degree of moral concern and urgency when some communities are affected more than others? To me, that seems likely. So again, back to our story. What about the decision of the state agency that was given the role of doing the procedural assessment of the particular wastewood incinerator in our story? In this case, initially, when the proposal came before the New York uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, interestingly named, um, they gave what's called a negative declaration. They said the proposal to site this wastewood incinerator doesn't need to have a full environmental review. We'll simply check a box and it can go forward. Again, I would say, are these active racists who made that decision? Probably not. Were there implicit biases at play? I can't see how there weren't. If this had been cited for Park Slope, Brooklyn, for those of you who know Brooklyn, uh, or for the Upper East Side of Manhattan, I can't imagine a world in which this would have had a box checked. I just can't. Now, why would that be so is, again, active animus. I have a feeling that what happened is, first of all, none of them had ever been to East New York, so they didn't really think about the people living there. All they knew, probably, about East New York was what people knew in the mid-90s. This is a place of high crime rates. This is the Myrtle Capital of the world. What's a little pollution in the Myrtle Capital of the world? Now, again, those were unlikely to be conscious thoughts but I have a feeling they may have affected the decision making. Now, when we brought to their attention this gross violation of, procedural, of, of the procedure of, of New York's environmental laws, they immediately changed and they rescinded their negative declaration and they went forward with environmental review, but it had to be brought to their attention. 
They had to be made mindful. They were not mindful on their own. Another question that many in the three minutes, okay. Another question that many in the community asked when we would have our community meetings is, this is about race, this is a violation of our civil rights, this is a violation of our constitutional rights, why aren't you, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, moving into federal court and, uh, and filing a equal protection lawsuit? Well, as Professor Lawrence alluded, in order to do so, we would have had to prove that discriminatory intent that, as I just described, would be very likely difficult to prove. Sam Summers talked about the case in which people stood up and said, you know, I don't have a racist bone in my body, or at least that was the subtext of their, I presume, slightly uh, more nuanced uh, portrayal. The DEC folks would have said the same things, and they would have been genuine. And we would never have prevailed on an intent claim. And I don't have time to go into why the federal civil rights statutes that might have protected us didn't, but if anyone's interested, we can talk about it another time. We would never have won a equal protection suit. Several were tried, and as you can see, with some really, really extreme context, and they all lost because, in my view, the judges who were deciding those cases couldn't quite grasp the, and sign on to the idea that the decision makers held animus, had intent to harm a particular group of people. They easily came up with the alternative justifications for the actions, and those were enough to, re, uh, to lead to a, a loss in court. Now, again, there's so much more to be said about the Environmental Justice Executive Order, which was enacted under, uh, which, which President Clinton signed. Fabulous language, oops, no private right of action. Um, state environmental justice statutes, one minute. Uh, state environmental justice statutes, lots of great language. Even California, there still are instances where we're seeing a disparate level of protection. So this leads us to, is this implicit bias? Is this structural racial, racialization, or is it both? And I would ar argue, undoubtedly, the latter. Right now, in the Obama administration's EPA, Half of the people I worked with in the environmental justice community are in very high-level positions, and these are people whose hearts, minds, souls, environment, uh, politics, every ounce of their being is devoted to environmental justice. So why haven't we seen the change we'd like to see? Because there are powerful, powerful institutional counterpoints that I think they would argue make it impossible. So the structural account has to be told along with the implicit bias account because even the best of us, if we were in positions of power, would have a hard fight so long as we have a country in which the voters will oppose with every ounce of their being decisions that will lead to, again, back to Professor Lawrence's articulation, the loss of the white privilege that keeps some areas protected at the expense of others. So how did the story end? This is the end. Uh, we won. We won. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just give me one second to tell how we won, because this is actually a great story in and of itself. We won not because of any of, of my, I thought, very clever environmental strategy, uh, legal strategies um, that I'd been trained to use by fabulous environmental lawyers. We won because a gentleman who was part of our community group in one of our community meetings said, isn't there a law that makes this illegal? And I thought he was talking kind of generally and horatorically, and I said, you know, there should be. You're so right, there should be. And he said, no, 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 no. Isn't there actually a law that makes this illegal? And I kind of looked at him he said, blankly, and he said, I know you weren't alive then. It was actually not true. But he said, in the 70s, there used to be an incinerator in every building, and that was made illegal. And I said, you know, I thought to myself, well, I know the city's trying to build an incinerator in, in, in Brooklyn. I know the state has been aware of this, so that doesn't seem right. But Charles Barron, the community leader, said, have you actually looked for this law? And I said, no, I had no idea it existed. And neither did any other environmental lawyer I've talked to about this case. He said, will you? I said, of course. I ran back to LDF. I went in the dusty New York City municipal laws, and I found that language that said, no person shall cause to permit the installation of refuse burning equipment. There was an exception for the city and an exception for incinerators on barges, but there was no exception for a waste wood incinerator in East New York, and then I thought, okay, wait, wood can't be waste. There's gotta be some reason why this, is, this can't be right. Look for the definition of waste, low. Waste wood was actually waste. So I literally ran around the office, Song might have been there, I literally ran around the office like cheering and wrote the longest essay, or longest memo ever on that small statute, 
And ultimately, we were able to send that to every politician and frankly, every media news outlet in the city, and we won. So, thank you. Uh, uh, while you visually inspect me, look at who I am and what I appear like, uh, you are racing me. What does that mean? Uh, you're putting me into a category. And so what I want to do is talk about communications law and bits of bias, but then give you some background on how I think about implicit bias and start maybe with a frame. So what am I really talking about? So when you see me, you put me into a category given rules that you've inherited from society, principally through visual inspection. You heard my last name. As soon as you put me into a category, which might be Asian, Asian American, you know, if you're going ethnic, you might think, is he Korean? Is he Chinese? Definitely not Filipino or Indian. If you're a little bit older, you might think Oriental. You you activate meanings about me by putting me into a category. Those meanings could be attitudinal, positive, negative, like, dislike, in the age of Facebook, thumbs up, thumbs down, hot, not hot, whatever those feelings are, maybe if he were a she hot, uh, however it's working for you. Uh, but there might also be stereotypes or attributes that are associated uh, with this category. Is it more likely than not that um, He's really good at math. I got a perfect score on his math SAT. Is it more likely or not that he knows martial arts? After all, he is Asian. Is it more likely or not that he had a tiger mom that forced him to practice violin four hours a day and play to Carnegie Hall at the age of seven? Two out of those three are true. So um, the point is, when these meanings get activated, it alters your interaction with me. Don't get me wrong, there are many roles that I occupy. You heard me as a professor, I'm here, I'm talking in a particular kind of way, I'm dressed in a particular kind of way, I'm performing an identity, but the idea is that the baggage in your head alters your interaction with me, and more interestingly, it happens automatically. Now, the goal here is to really find the following. The goal here really is to find what kind of baggage you have in your head. But as we've learned in modern times, you can't just sidle up to someone and say, well, what do you really think about X? What do you really think about black men? What do you really think about Asian women? Uh, they won't tell you, they want to be both PC, and it turns out we lack introspective access. Uh, to the junk in our heads. And so through the oftentimes clever, devious, incredibly smart right, uh, research of the scientists that you've heard uh, on panels like the first, we find out that there are these things called implicit biases. They're stereotypes and attitudes that we are just unaware of. And frankly, if you knew about them, you would not explicitly endorse them as either being accurate or appropriate. We know that they exist. We know that they are pervasive. We know that they are large in magnitude. We increasingly know that they have real world impact and what we care about in some ways is to try to figure out how we might take countermeasures. How do we change behavior that we think is driven by implicit biases? I mean, there's only two ways you can do it. You could either change the bias themselves, right, biases themselves, or maybe break the link between the biases, the mental associations, and the behavior. But as you go into this paradigm of thinking about countermeasures, right, the stuff that uh, Professor Devine was talking about, as you think about the countermeasures, you have these critical questions that come up. Like, where do the biases come from in the first place? Where did this, these mental associations uh, come from, and can we do anything about them, uh, especially with the constraints of law? So in the chapter that I wrote about communications, I wanted to think a little bit about where does the junk in our heads come from? So, not to be overly reductionist, look, there's only nature versus nurture. Whenever you see images of the brain, you're inclined to think that things are hardwired, right? And so the brain imaging work that you saw, although this was not explicitly the argument that Professor Bernage was making, makes you think, well, maybe it's hardwired that we think of in-groups and out-groups in a particular way. And her work uh, with other colleagues have demonstrated that primates also, uh, using a, I, I guess you probably don't call it the monkey IAT, but that's how I think of it, uh, you could actually give IATs to primates. Uh, and actually see similar phenomena. So maybe it's all hardwired, like we're, like, we're just mean people uh, who are cognitively hard hardwired to be afraid of the other. What I want to emphasize is that even if you think that some need to define other versus us is hardwired within our brains through hundreds of thousands of years of natural selection. The very fact that we might draw in-groups and out-groups don't tell us where specifically we paint the lines. It doesn't certainly tell us what specific stereotypes to associate with particular categories. So even if the brain gives us a cognitive canvas, it's pretty clear that nurture paints the specific pictures. By nurture, I mean the practice that Professor Bernanke talked about what Professor Devine quoted as, it's what people told me when I was younger, what Professor Lawrence commented on when he talks about the story told the little girl 
from birth about who was good, who was bad, what was pretty, what was not, what was naughty, what was nice. So we get experience, we are told stories, not only directly by interacting with other people, right? So think about what you think about American Indians, right? And it might be that your thoughts about American Indians, both explicit and implicit, come from actual interactions with American Indians. Or maybe it's from the movies that you watched. And given the fact that there's radical residential segregation that still persists, and depending on what part of the country you come from, the idea that direct experiences with actually the other, the African American youth, the American Indian, the Asian lesbian, um, if you really think it's about direct experiences, you're overestimating the amount of direct contact you have with the other. The truth is we're pretty much isolated in lots of domains that we occupy. What feeds us the baggage are what I call vicarious experiences. They're stories told by others. Now, these days through electronic media, right? It's the movies that we watch, the books that we read, the stories that we're told, the hearsay that we hear. It is these vicarious experiences of the other that act as the input that feeds the neural network that is roughly our mind. And the more stories that we hear, the more associations we're told, the more these particular linkages build up in our brains. And so this requires us to think about media, about how it is we actually get vicarious stories of the other in modern times. Now, media includes lots of different things that we talk about. In the book, I talk about entertainment, I talk about news, I talk about even online virtual worlds. Um, given time, I'll talk about just a few things, right? So think about um, entertainment. Movies. You, you don't have to come from LA like I do to know that stereotypes sell, right? Stereotypes are heuristics, they're short stories, they make immediate sense, and you don't, again, have to have a film degree to parse any modern film, especially a blackbuster, and know why certain characters are certain characters, uh, why, uh, why Denzel Washington appears in all the movies. You know, you, you can figure out that stereotypes sell, but, but that's an explicit story. I think there's some really interesting evidence, uh, and I'm going to give one example from a study by uh, Weisbuck and colleagues uh, in 2009 that suggests that there might be ways that even if it's not an explicit over-the-top stereotype that's being invoked, that implicit biases could be propagated. So what he and his colleagues did was parse 11 TV uh, shows that were quite popular, uh, shows that I actually don't watch, CSI Miami, um, and they coded up the body language toward black and white targets in a particular way. And social psychologists are incredibly good at having a sophisticated grammar on deciding whether or not there's eye contact, whether or not across my arms, whether I have a forward, forward body lean stutter in my speech. So they code up the body language toward characters, and what they find is subtle discrimination. You can't tell from the transcript. Uh, and no one who actually regularly watches the show thinks that these black or white characters are being treated differently. But in the actual body language, you see an actual difference of more negative body language to black targets versus white targets, even if you hold their status constant. They then find a correlation that the more shows that you watch with worse body language, toward these black characters, the higher your race IAT scores, the implicit association test. And when they experimentally manipulate viewers by giving you either two treatment clips, either a silent video clip where you see body language that is deemed to be pro-white or pro-black, then you measure their IATs, you get different responses. Now, this doesn't tell you everything, but it certainly suggests something. It's an example where even if you're not playing to over-the-top stereotypes, simple things as implicit and hard to measure as body language could help propagate the messages and the junk in our heads. You might think, well, that's just entertainment. The news is just the facts, ma'am. Of course, that's going to be value-added, but of course, that is also fanciful. What's on the news? Violent news stories dominates. In the industry, they say if it bleeds, it leads. By many accounts, local news, 25% uh, includes violent crime stories that prominently feature black and brown faces. And there's a lot of work that demonstrates that if you are constantly associating violent crime in your neighborhood with black and brown faces that don't necessarily correlate with actual arrest rates or even actual rates of crime, then you're going to be deepening a particular kind of virulent mental association that predicts certain kinds of outcomes. Political scientists Frank Gilliam at UCLA and Shantua Iyengar now at Stanford did a great study where, again, it's basically an audit kind of study. All you do is change what the race of a mugshot. It's only like a 10 second or five second flash in a 10 minute news clip. If you use a black mugshot versus a white mugshot, 
on the exact same crime story and then ask about how punitive people want to be, whether they want to vote for three strikes and you're out kinds of laws, they saw a 6% uptick in favor of punitive measures right after they see the violent crime story with the black mugshot. A five second difference in a single mugshot in a simulated news story leads to differences. Um, if you thought that maybe all the kids doing crazy stuff online uh, will usher in a new world of kind of cyber utopia where race won't exist and we'll all play druids or elves and I don't know, exchange and uh, in made up economies and everything, yeah, not so much. So uh, there's an interesting study that Eastwick and Gardner did back in 2009. So it turns out that there are lots of virtual worlds where you could actually pick up and be human characters. You might think like, who has time for this? It turns out all your children do. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, if they're not shooting things in first-person shooter, they're playing and flirting online. And you can pick who you want to be, and part of the niceties of being in the virtual world is you can decide how tall you want to be, how tall you think you should be, how thin you ought to be. You could pick your skin color. You could either pick milk or espresso. And what they found out is that there's a couple different techniques for influencing people. There's one technique called the foot-in-the-door technique, where you go up to someone, you first give a very small ask, and they say yes. Then you ask for something bigger, and oftentimes they're more likely to say yes because it trades on a need for someone to be consistent. Like, I gave you the small favor, I want to be consistent, I will also do you the big favor. This is probably important for fundraising, right? So the, there's that kind of notion called foot in the door. There's another tactic which goes the opposite direction called door in the face. You do this huge ask, will you give me a million dollars? They say, like, in this economy, I don't think so. Uh, and then you ask for a small ask. That trades on reciprocity because you went down, you're saying, okay, I was a little too much, I'm gonna be a little bit more reasonable in my ask, will you meet me halfway? That trades on the notion of reciprocity. Notice that reciprocity, however, requires you to feel some affiliation with the person who did the asking. And what they find out is that foot in the door techniques work online, whether you're a milk or espresso hued character, but door in the face technique, which requires, again, this idea of in-group affiliation, like you're part of me, you were being nice to me, I will be nice back to you, that that worked only if your avatar was light skin. Now, come on, this isn't an explicit rational calculation. You can't walk up to someone and say, do you expect differential evaluations of favor asks in an online world based on the simulated skin color of characters that don't exist? Rationally, people are gonna say, no, no, that won't influence me one bit. Uh, why would it? They're not even real, much less consistent with my belief that I am a meritocratic colorblind person, no. But again, the data suggests otherwise. So implicit biases are in the electronic environment. They are manifested and propagated through our culture, which means through communications law. Okay, what to do about it? If I persuaded to you, if I persuaded you that the junk in our heads come principally from vicarious experiences mediated through the electronic environment, what might we do? Look, there's nothing easy, right? It's hard to fix for all kinds of reasons. Stereotypes sell for a reason. Sex sells, violence sells, stereotypes sell. Moreover, we have a First Amendment that makes it very difficult for the state to engage in particular kinds of content control. All I'm going to do is suggest two very quick things that draw on two articles that I wrote a long time ago. Back in 2005, I wrote an article called Trojan Horses of Race that unpack some aspects of FCC law. Um, the details are way beyond uh, uh, appropriate for this audience. Uh, I don't want you to put all of you immediately to sleep, but I want to tell you that the FCC regulates our airwaves. It does so in furtherance of this thing called the public interest. The public interest standard, which is codified in the Communications Act, very hard to define, but what the FCC has basically said is that public interest amounts to local news. And here's a representative paragraph that describes it. They say, we want diversity, competition, localism, all these things about public interest. They say, the best way to measure this stuff is by looking at how much local news stations are actually playing. So they're willing to decide media policy 
on the basis of whether or not you will show more local news. But it turns out what is on the local news, violent crime stories, which actually exacerbate negative stereotypes of African Americans and Latinos. So we're encouraging affirmatively a metric of quality that exacerbates implicit bias. And I've argued elsewhere that there are better metrics possible, like for example, the number of investigative journalists on the ground that you could actually count as a way to further public interest. You can think about devising public service announcements. The bottom line here is in terms of the law within broadcast, the agency should do no harm and alter its definition of the public interest interpretation, which would then create fewer incentives for us to propagate content content that actually does harm. The final thing is it turns out all the kids are playing Minecraft now. It's about design. All that I want you to think about is the social contact hypothesis. We integrated the schools for a reason, maybe on a faith that having kids who look different, who sat next to each other, would end up decreasing the prejudice they had against each other. There are actually ways to do this online in ways that are actually surprising. And in part because the architecture of social interaction looks different online, there are different ways to actually allow for engagements as well as a slow delay in the actual disclosure of identity that could possibly increase the quantity and quality of social interactions that would decrease prejudice. It's only, uh, obviously, a skim of a thought, uh, and there's much more where that came from, but I want to be mindful of time. The only thing that I want to conclude with, uh, with all this, is to suggest in, you know, uh, Justin Levinson asked, what will the science look like in the future? And I think everyone, at least within the law, is mindful of evidence of predictive validity, the fact that implicit biases have real impact in the real world, harm that we should care about and can demonstrate. The other part will be about malleability, about how we change. And that's gonna be both at the level of tweaking the biases themselves they're created, and then breaking the link between the biases and the behavior. I think that's where the next generation is, and when we take those larger questions, we will have to engage in implicit bias across the law. Thank you. So I'm, we're not going to take any questions, but I do want to ask Professor Kong to, since he speaks so fast and he has very little junk in his head and he's hot, to stay <laughs> up here and, and maybe sum up what we can expect to see in terms of progress yeah. in this in this new, fast-evolving world based upon what we've heard in the brick-and-mortar world. So, Here. you know, the, o the only thing, you know, what's, what's great about the book, right, and what the objective of the book is to, ex is to push the boundaries even within among legal thinkers to think about implicit bias and its implications, not in, again, just employment discrimination in traditional fields, but outside. And what we see is the first... Um, in some ways, we see a push, and I think this catalyst will lead more and more legal thinkers to have a more sophisticated diagnosis of disparities that uh, plague all of us. So like some of the stuff that Charles Lawrence, uh, uh, Chuck Lawrence does so well, right, is to think about not only explicit biases that may be concealed or not, but to think about structural processes and implicit biases. And I think in the law, what we're going to see is the importation of the social science to try to push it out into different fields, but then to try to create a set of interpenetrating insights that don't play, uh, I think, foolish uh, reductionist either-or games. Oh, it must be explicit animus or implicit bias, or as Rachel Goss said, it must be structural or implicit. It's actually all those things. And to be able to stack the layers of knowledge in an integrated way that tells a consistent story, that lights a fire among people who want to do the right thing but can't be sure what the right thing is any longer. I think that's what's going to have happen in the law. And I think within the science, the scientists do their own thing, but I see a, a huge amount of collaboration that's starting, whether it's in the form of amicus briefs that are being written uh, more carefully, uh, or a mindfulness of what questions might be most appropriate or interesting via direct collaboration with people who do law and policy work in even the study design. There are many of us who've participated very closely with scientists, including co-authoring papers, to design studies that create knowledge that just by a small tweak would become that much more relevant to the legal and policy questions of the time. So I'm deeply optimistic. I will caution that there will be a huge amount of pushback in all kinds of ways. Any move towards complexity, any move that challenges 
the conception that we are anything but ultimately a meritocratic colorblind tournament, there are all kinds of reasons why we want to justify the system and the status quo as is, and the scientists could tell you better than I. And the pushback on this, invoking both junk science tropes principally, but also ideas that this is, uh, you know, this is all essentially an argument for massive wealth transfers under, again, the rubric of science when in fact it's all nonsense. That kind of pushback, which we've seen in the law reviews and again, even in the science journals, uh, to some extent, is going to be what we see played out even further. Um, but it, these are exciting times, and exciting, and, and, and for me, in quite optimistic ways. Thank you.